the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable, O oh God, in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. I need a little volume here. We got less voice today. Our scripture lesson for today is found in the letter of James, in the New Testament, James chapter four. And I, I will start reading at verse 13. I'll be reading from 13 through 15, James chapter 4, 13 through 15, focusing on verse 14, the end of verse 14. But we're looking at James chapter 4, starting at verse 13. Say amen when you're there. Amen. From the New International Version, it says, now listen. You who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist, vapor, that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. This is the word of the Lord. Let's give God thanks. Amen. Short, sweet, and to the point, and it deserves, the Lord's word deserves a hand. Amen. <laughs> she said. I want you to pray with me today on the theme, the relative brevity of life. The relative brevity of life. This letter written by James was written to Jewish Christians during a time when they were scattered throughout the Mediterranean after persecution. In this letter, James is very direct when he talks about genuine religion, genuine faith, and genuine wisdom. James is calling these Christians to be authentic to be real in their service to God. He starts in chapter one speaking to the 12 tribes that had been scattered throughout the nations and he speaks first about trials and tribulations. And we get from those verses the very familiar verse to many of us that says, consider it all joy when you run into diverse or when you run into different types of trials. Because the testing of your faith, he says, produces patience. It produces perseverance. Then he goes on to talk about how everyone ought to be quick to listen but slow to speak and slow to anger. Because of the effect that human anger has on a person's spirit, the effect that it has on a person's righteousness. And then he goes on and he talks, among other things, about faiths and deeds. And the famous quote comes from the second chapter of James that says, there is a direct link between having faith in God and the work or the deeds that we do in the kingdom. When it says, faith without works is dead. Then James goes on in chapter 3 to talk about the tongue, the power of our tongue. And he says, consider that a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. 
Well, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. He says it corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Oh, and then he moves on in chapter 3 to talk about our requirement to submit ourselves to God, to surrender ourselves and our wills to the will of God and to allow God to direct our path, to lead God and direct us into all truth through the Holy Spirit, to allow God to be the true head of all of our lives. And we read in the early parts of chapter 4 the words that God opposes the proud, but he shows favor on the humble. And James instructs that we are to, therefore to submit ourselves then to God and to resist the devil, and he will flee from us if we resist. And then in James chapter 4, verse 13 that I just read, he says, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. <laughs> Apparently, some people were doing just that on a regular basis. James addresses this issue and says, You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. And you're talking about with certainty what you're going to do next year or even next month. James was pointing out a tendency, maybe it's even a habit, that the people had of being so certain about what they were going to do next or where they were going to go. You know that same tendency or habit that we have today. How many of us have recently, recently said that we're going to do this or do that? And we're going to go here or there next week, next year, maybe 10 years from now. How many of us believing all the while that it will surely happen and it will happen the way we plan it? <laughs> we did that yesterday in leadership for next year. We planned all of 2015 with certainty that it would happen. We as people are very comfortable, we are very assured that certain things are going to happen because we sometimes feel that if we plan a thing, it will happen just as we planned it. Or at least it'll come pretty close. Again, yesterday in our leadership session, we talked about the uncertainty of life and the events of our lives. We also talked about planning and the importance of planning and doing anything of substance to God, for God. And we talked about the inevitability of uncertainty even in the face of our plans, that you can count on some unexpected things to crop up whenever, whenever you are planning something or seeking to execute something. But we also said that the good leader, the effective leader, is someone who learns how to manage uncertainty, how to navigate through the uncertainties of life, leaning and depending on a God who can help us through. But uncertainty is a part of life. And it often challenges many of us. Uncertainty sometimes feels like instability for some of us. Uncertainty challenges our ability to feel like we are in control of things. And some of us desperately need to be in control of something. And some of us will find a way to make things happen in our lives, or at least that's what we think we're doing even though we should all know by now that there is very little that we really are in control of. Uncertainty means to some of us that what I expect to happen just might not happen, and then I'll have to go back to, to the drawing board, starting all over again, charting a new course. Uncertainty has a way of placing us on what we feel like shaky ground because we just don't seem to be able to get a firm handle on anything that we can be certain about. But James seems to indicate in this passage, at least as it applies to planning for things in the future with certainty, or as he says later in those passages, with arrogance, 
that we are not in control of our lives. He says that we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone next week, next month, or next year. That there is very little that we can be so certain about that we can boast about it as if we have some kind of control over it. How can we plan with such certainty in our minds that which we think will happen when we have no idea what's going to happen in between? I had lunch actually the other day with a friend of mine and we were talking about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for me at home is at the end of the month and, and I, she actually is Scotian but her family uh, lives in New York and she's for years gone home as she calls it for um, Thanksgiving just as we have. And we were talking about though how things have changed so much over the years, you plan your Thanksgiving and you go and everything is perfect the way you thought it would be and you come back and you plan for the next year. But as time goes on, you realize that things are very different. For one thing, members of the family who were always there, some of them have died. Other family members have moved to distant places in the world and the their time together is usually shorter than it ever was because of travel schedules. And still there are others in the family who have illnesses that um, curtail their ability to be involved in all of the family activities. And we both had to admit that we cannot plan like we used to for everything to be the same each year. And in fact, she said, I can't even plan for this year two weeks from now because I don't know what's going to happen. James says here at the end of verse 14, what is your life? Then he says, you are but a mist. Another translation says a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes. Now that's something to really think about. If we are not careful, we can lose sight of the relative brevity of our lives. We can mistakenly believe that we've always got time left to do this or to do that according to our plans. We can erroneously rely on the fact that God blessed us to see another year and so God's going to bless us to see many more years. God knows anybody who's lost a loved one suddenly can testify that life is but a mist, a vapor that is here today, but then quickly gone tomorrow. Think about a mist when you spray something in the air and you see the mist come out, how quickly it goes away. Or think about a vapor, a smoky or gaseous type of substance that moves quickly and then dissipates and vanishes. James says we are merely a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Think about your life. What is your life? And have you ever paused to think about your life in relation to the lives of people that have been in your life but who have died during your lifetime? They were here one day and then they were gone the next and the next and the next. In the overall scheme of things, in God's economy, in time eternal, our earthly lives are but a vapor, a lingering puff of smoke or a hint of gas, like a small cloud of fog, small drops of particles mixed with the air, water in the form of very small droplets floating in the air, like a fine spray that eventually breaks down dissipates and wastes away, vanishing quickly from its former existence. You look for it and it cannot be found because it is no more. I remember just after my mother died in 2004, my grandmother had already died in 2003 and, and she lived in the house with us as we were growing up, so it was mom and grandmommy. And I was there, I was at home, I was in the kitchen with my dad and I was sitting in a chair that faces the stairwell that goes upstairs. And all of a sudden, I was thinking about my mom, and all of a sudden I got what I, the only thing I can call it is a vision. And I saw them go up and down those stairs, 
go in the kitchen, do something, go in the family room, go out to the solarium, go out to the living room, up and down, and it was like fast motion, just going up, grandma would come down, go get her a little cup, go to her chair, go over here, do the same thing, but, but it was fast motion, and it was fast, and it was like they were going up, 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 and then they were gone. Now the truth is, we all know that in any day there are many hours, and so even though I looked at this as being their day-to-day -day activity, up and down those stairs, they come down, then they go back up. That would be a long time if it really was a day. Because grandmommy was 96 when she died and mama was 71. But after they both died, I was sitting there and the vision was so clear to me and it brought to me this scripture that says they were but a vapor down, up and down, in here, go in here, go do this, go, go, and then gone. I always left mama's shoes, we, we like mama's shoes, we like mama's stuff, and so her shoes were still sitting there. We, we like to keep their stuff close by. Now if I go to the house now, I won't see them there anymore. I won't see the pattern of their lives that was so predictable and so easy to depend on for so many years for so many Thanksgivings and for so many Christmases because it has all ceased. It has vanished. And what was certain for me for so many years has now become uncertain because they are no more. What I have now, and it's quite a lot, I have the strength of my relationship with them, I have the memories that shall never die, and the promise of the great reunion up in heaven when we all get together again, but their physical presence, their earthly lives are no more. In that experience, with that vision, I got to visualize what James was talking about. When God allowed me to travel to see the essence of their lives day after day, up and down the staircase of life, and then to see it end. It all ceased right before my very eyes. They were just a mist, a vapor, something here one day, and then gone the next. James urges us in this passage to consider the relative brevity of our life. He encourages us to consider just how short, just how brief, that's what brevity is, our life really is in the totality of time. Whether we live for a short time or whether we live for a very long time, our lives are relatively brief in the overall scheme of things. Our lives are short. Life is but a puff of smoke, a mist that eventually, oftentimes without warning, will vanish away. And because we find this to be true, there must be a change in our attitude that says that we can plan for things without regard to the possibility that something could happen and throw all of our plans out the window. So our planning takes on a new character. Our planning is not based on our will alone, but James teaches that it is based on the will of the Father, our Father who made heaven and earth. James says there in verse 15, instead, instead of boasting or talking with arrogance about what we're going to do or where we're going to go next year, he says we ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and we will do this or that. James is calling for humility in the body of Christ to recognize that it is in God that we live and it is in God that we move and it is in God that we have our being, as Paul taught us. This scripture is not calling us to live lives in fear of dying, 
nor is it aimed at directing us to not bother with any planning because something might happen to destroy our plans. There is nothing about this message today that is designed to make us afraid or worried about just how long our life will last. But the intent of the scripture is to refocus us into an understanding and a belief that our very existence is totally dependent on the one true God. That as the songwriter says, Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand because my life is in your hands. Whether we live or die is in, the, is in the hands of the almighty God who stands on the walls of time and who orchestrates the events of our lives. Our lives are but a vapor apart from God. Our existence, our earthly existence is limited and uncertain. It is unpredictable and unsure unless and until we get our focus set on God because it is the Lord's will whether we'll do this or do that. And we need to firmly believe this and not just use those words as a catchy cliche that Christians say all the time. If it's the Lord's will, we need to believe it because it is the Lord's will. Why do you think somebody can do whatever they want to do to their body and in their life, abusing their body in all kinds of ways, engaging in reckless and dangerous activity that can cause permanent damage or even kill them, and that same person can still survive? Likewise, somebody can do everything right, follow all the rules, get all the medical checkups, take all the prescribed medicines, eat all the healthiest foods, and still end up with an illness a debilitating illness that can severely impair their life or worse yet, cause death. Somebody can be in a near fatal accident and live to tell the story without a scratch on their body while somebody else can be murdered while just sitting in their home, hit by a stray bullet that was intended for another target that was outside of the home. Oh, the list goes on. And as difficult, as difficult as all of that is to take, especially when we think about the wrong that is done that can cause some innocent person to suffer, or in some cases to die, as we've been saying over these past two weeks, God is in con control of all things. We don't understand it. We often disagree with it. But if we believe that God is omnipotent, means he has all power. And we believe that he's omniscient, that means he knows all things. And we believe that he's omnipresent, that means he's everywhere present all at the same time. Then we have to swallow the bitter pill. We trust God. We trust that God knows what God is doing when God allows things in the lives of God's people, whether we understand it or not. Because our lives are but a vapor a small part of God's overall divine plan. We as the created have no right and no ability to try to tell the creator what the creator ought to do. For we are here today and then gone tomorrow. But while we are here, it would do us well, James says, to say and to believe that it is the Lord's will, that I will live, and I will do this, and I will do that. It is the Lord's will that will govern our life while we still have breath in our body and while the blood is still running warm in our veins. This past Sunday, Reverend Miles Monroe from the Bahamas died in a fatal airplane crash they claimed the lives of Reverend Monroe, his wife, and seven other ministry people. Reverend Monroe, many of you might know, was a noted international Christian evangelist and pastor, known and respected by many all over the world for his ministry, his teachings, his extensive collection of books, that's how a lot of people know about him, and the many pastors and ministries that he mentored and contributed to. Reverend Monroe was 62 years old when he died suddenly on Sunday when 
Their Learjet hit a construction crane while they were landing in Freeport, Bahamas, preparing, he and the ministry team, preparing for a huge conference that he always has a leadership conference. The plane crashed, blew up in flames, and all of them perished. As the news began to hit, there was widespread disbelief that something so tragic could happen to such a well-known and respected and important man. Now, Reverend Monroe had his critics, to be sure, and, and rightfully so. I don't agree with everything he talked about, but Reverend Monroe is responsible for significant work in God's kingdom. And he is being mourned by uh, what, thousands, maybe even millions, all over the world. One of the constant messages that I love so much from Reverend Monroe, it, uh, it always inspired me, it certainly found it to be true, was his familiar phrase that he wanted to die empty. He would say that we need to stop making the cemetery wealthy. He said that too many people are dying with gifts inside of them and taking all of those gifts, those riches, to the grave. He said his goal was to give it all, all of his ideas, his thoughts, his programs, his energy, his love, to give it all while he was still alive so that when it came time for him to die, he would be empty. He would die empty just like Jesus did. And he often quoted those words that Jesus uttered while he was on the cross when he said, it is finished. <laughs> so Jesus in the mind of Reverend Monroe and certainly in mine died empty. He poured out his life as a sacrificial offering to the world so that the world might be saved. And Jesus could truly say when it was all said and done, it is finished because he had done everything he had been sent here to do. Well, when I read many of the comments uh, on social media from people who knew Reverend Monroe personally and those who had been taught by him, I could hear the shock and dismay and then the extreme pain that so many people were going through as they mourned him. And, it, it, your heart just goes out. It ha, it's very difficult. I didn't know him personally, and I felt it, so I can imagine those who did. But this scripture that we're looking at today, it speaks directly to even his situation. When it says that our lives, and hear this, our lives, no matter how important, no matter how significant, no matter how impactful, our lives are but a mist just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. But we should take the advice of Reverend Monroe and more importantly, follow the supreme example of Jesus Christ our Lord and seek to give everything we have while we are still yet here, while our vapor is still alive and visible and vibrant and effective effective while we still have breath and energy and ideas and promise and enthusiasm and joy and the desire to help somebody while we are still yet here we need to use everything we've got such that when we leave we can say <laughs> it is finished. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Uh, Jesus. Jesus gave it all. We want to give it all for the sake of Christ. The one who Paul describes in Philippians by saying, who being in the very nature of God, Jesus did not count it robbery. He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, yea, even death 
on a cross. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and in earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. What is your life anyway? <laughs> you know, there aren't like top shelf mists, vapors, and low shelf mists. A mist and a vapor is all the same. Uh, <laughs> I know you bad. I know you got that thing going on, but all the same. A mist, a vapor, here today, gone tomorrow. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I guarantee you, <laughs> this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As a woman